So shall we begin? It's 12.30. Mm -hmm. Pretty much on the dot. Um, well, thank you all for coming today. I'm Gigi Barnhill. I'm president of the trustees of the Amherst Historical Society. And we're delighted that the Bang Center has been making space for us while we await the return of the Jones Library public spaces. They closed them off early this year. Um, today we have a wonderful guest speaker, Peter Grima, Grima uh, who's going to talk to us about Mount Toby, which rises 1,269 feet, about 1,000 feet higher than where we are in the center of town. And it's the highest summit of a collection of mostly wooded hills and knolls in the towns of Sunderland and Leverett. Okay, come on in. Sit down. No, we're not going to climb the world So as we'll learn in a little bit, Mount Toby is notable for its high biodiversity, attractive woodlands, waterfalls, and its glacial kettle ponds. From the summit on a clear day, I don't think it's good today, on a clear day you can see all the way north to Mount Manette in New Hampshire. And it's a dynamic landscape, a mosaic of disparate human and natural influences that is continuously shaped by natural disturbances and forest pests and diseases, adding layers of heterogeneity to the botanical tapestry. So having hiked and explored Mount Toby for 20 years, local botanist Peter Grimo will speak about the forest changes and diverse flora that he has personally observed spanning the development of his own botanical and ecological expertise. Please welcome Peter. Thank you. Thanks everybody for coming in for a post, it's a very post-apocalyptic day with the snowstorm and the earthquake this morning. And then there's the eclipse coming on Monday, so a lot going on. Um, would you, George, is it okay if I shut one light? Um, so, what brings me here first is a debt of gratitude to Gigi, who gave me a tour of the Strong House back in August and might have permitted me to poke around in some antique furniture and look at the construction, give me a very personalized tour. Um, and then I asked lots of questions and followed up with many more questions, and uh, I, I guess I, I owed historical society so to share some of my knowledge after demanding so much of her. So um, what also brought me to this topic to, as a presentation was a year ago. So this is a painting by artist Kate Spencer, who mm -hmm. lives in Montague Center. Um, and she made a whole series of paintings on her favorite place, Mount Toby. And there was an exhibit at Oxbow Gallery last March, so just over a year ago. And she wanted to she had this vision of an art and science culmination of the, the exhibit. And she asked around and somehow found me as the most complicit person. Um, and in the process of thinking about whether I deserve to talk about Mount Toby in this talk, I realized it is the single most familiar place to me. It's more familiar than the woods I grew up in. Um, because it's been you know, 20 years now. Um, that's really uh, basically the bulk of my adult life. And I've, it spanned such a gradual transformation in my own career that it's really tied to my identity right now. Um, and I know so much about it, I need to share it with people. So I'm glad you're here to listen to me share about it. Um, I'll just give you a little. Cave, right? This is the Sunderland Caves, and uh, I said this painting is actually in my living room. This oh, nice. Nice. Yeah. It's very is this is that big, or it's a three by three, so it's, oh, it's, nice. it's very big. Um, she, I think there's she's planning another exhibit. I think next year. I forget if it's in Sunderland or what. Let me just orient you, orient you a little bit here. Oops, I have to turn this on. Um, I don't have, the laser pointer doesn't point at the TV, unfortunately. So. Um, this is Mount Toby, the massive of bedrock that sticks up in the antique valley, the Pioneer Valley. And most of what people are familiar with is that clump of hills to the top. I don't have to point on this side. Um, this pork shop, pork chop shaped thing is Toby proper, is what I call it. Um, then there's Rory Mountain, which is a lumpy bulk of hills to the southeast. And then this little ridge right here is Ox Hill. And those are the three peaks that encompass the bulk of the highest points of Mount Toby. Um, 
you know, and you look out the window, it looks like a big chunk of woods, but it's a, just like the rest of the east, eastern United States. It's a mosaic of complex ownerships. These are the public ownerships. The mustard yellow is the Mount Toby, the UMass demonstration forest. Dark green is DCR. Light green is Mass Wildlife. There's some municipal lands in there. And the purple, the very bottom, is Nature Conservancy, <coughs> where green swamp and Bolton are. Um, it's a real complex mosaic. Lots of publicly accessible lands. The Robert Frost Trail runs the whole length of it. And where's the road? I mean, how far over is it? Um, let's see, 63 is running right along the edge of the screen, and 47 is running right off the river on that side. Oh, OK. So. The, uh, so, let me think about this. So the, the way I first knew Mount Toby, but I came to, I came to Amherst to go to grad school. Technically, it was a second bachelor's, <coughs> and then grad school. Um, 20 in August 03. So, oh. um, and this is how I knew Mount Toby, is this, mm -hmm. this oh, nice. thing in the distance. And I used to study on the upper floors of the Boys Library. Um, and I'd say, I don't, I just remember thinking, as a young, much younger man, I need to go there. I just had this thought, like, I need to get in those hills for some reason. I, you know, I had never hiked in my life until I moved up to Amherst. Um, and that's pretty much how, you know, it became a place I hiked. I think that was so. I think it might have, it might not be quite 20 years. It might have been May in 04. My wife and I, now wife, we went on a hike and I got us lost. And <laughs> we ended up hiking all the way down to Bull Hill and walking up 63. And we didn't have water or snacks. <laughs> <laughs> I was in my 20s. <laughs> um, so, you know, I'm not trusted with a sense of direction still. Um, but that's, it became a place to go to, to hike, to something different. It's close to Amherst, but it's very different than the Holy Oak Range. Um, and that's pretty much how I, uh, I was a physics major at the time. And I went to grad school in physics at UMass, here at UMass. And eventually, just to escalate the narrative, I stopped. I didn't want to think about fundamental particles anymore. And I wanted to think about trees. So I ended up hopping across campus into a grad program in forestry. And then that became, and Mount Toby became like a living laboratory. Where I was already going there all the time. I lived in Montague Center at that point. Um, and it's right there. I was going there three or four times a week. And it became a place where to think about trees in a new scientific way. So that became a training ground. And my advisor, who some of you may know him, Bill Patterson, um, Professor, professor Emeritus from Mass. These kids went through Amherst schools. These kids are older than me, so um, he uh, prevailed upon me to take a class I really didn't want to take <laughs> called New England Flora, um, which was taught by Dr. Karen Searcy. Some of you may also know that Ms. Karen and her husband, Dennis, lived in Amherst for 40 years or so um, before they moved back to Southern California, which is 2019. Um, she taught this course. She was the director or the curator at the year of the at UMass. She taught this course, New England Flora, which is essentially plant taxonomy, which I thought I knew all I needed to know because I knew my trees. I didn't, what do I need to know about plant taxonomy for? Um, and Karen taught me the most important thing, which is that I'm actually a botanist. <laughs> I didn't know that. She saw it in me years before I did. Um, so it was obviously worthwhile of my professor to force me to take that course. Um, I did an adjunct, because we're graduate credit, looking at sedges and, sedges and specimens that are as old as myself. And apparently I liked that. Not many people do. <laughs> um, and then, you know, taking that class, I had this new skill set, and I took it to Mount Toby. So all these, all these little things that I've been ignoring. And I was actually, it was just this time of year, very early April, and uh, I was getting a little dismayed, because it's it a little colder. Um, Even at Montague Center, is like a very different climate. Um, and then I stopped to tie my shoe, and that was like, this is the watershed moment. These little panicle oh, flowers were just yeah. right there. Yeah. And you know, in the spring, there's all these little mauve and lavender hues in the leaf litter, so they can, it looks, when you blow it up to this, it's, how could you walk by that? But until you're right within six feet of it, it really, they don't necessarily jump out at you. Um, and this is still the flower that sort of melts the winter away from me every year. Um, they're flowering right now, although they don't—they tend to close up on chilly, cloudy days. Um, it's also known as liver leaf because the leaves, which last through the winter, um, have these three lobes, which 
I'm told, a liver is shaped like a liver. So, um, so that's that was the watershed moment that, and then ever since then I've worked in the woods as a forester for the state and I have plenty of opportunity to indulge my botanical diversions, which have become an avocation. Um, and part of that avocation, you know, Karen became my, what I call my botanical godmother. Uh -huh. um, so I used to tell her about things I was seeing. I work in the Berkshires. There's all sorts of interesting plants to encounter. Um, sort of keep in touch with her that way. And then I live in Franklin County. And uh, I send her interesting orchids and things I'd find. And eventually she said, you know, a few of us are working on this project on the county floor, for the floor of Franklin County. Um, maybe you'd be interested in coming out on some of our field excursions to document the floor. And within, a, you know, that I got scooped up into this project with people that were my mentors and people I looked up to. Um, and, and ultimately, in 2020, we published the county floor, which is oh, nice. a gigantic tome of a book uh -huh. that has uh, thousands and thousands of <coughs> field hours and observations. Um, that looked at the historical flora and the documented town by town, the present flora. Um, uh, this is, yeah, Dr. Robert Burton's professor emeritus from College of Holy Cross. And he's done a number, he's sort of the godfather of floristic inventories in Massachusetts. Karen Searcy there, Matt Hickler, um, he's a UMass PhD also, and a database in aquatics, ways among other things, and Glenn Modskin teaches at Conway School of Landscape Design, formerly Harvard Forest, a researcher for many years. Um, so, <laughs> let's see, what was my segue there? Um, that's, in the course of the, floor, the county flora, really my highlight moments were going to Mount Toby, particularly Karen and I went to Mount Toby many times, went all, to all sorts of places I'd never seen, saw tons of plants I never thought I'd be looking for there. And I still find things. I go back to the same place as Karen and I went, and I still find things I never saw there before. Um, so I have these really fond memories of you know, going out in the woods with my botanical mentor. Um, and also, it quickly became apparent that Mount Toby was a very special place in the county. And it was, this is long, very long known. Question? Yeah, um, pardon my ignorance, but what are vascular flora? Vascular flora as the higher, they call higher plants, so less non-vascular flora include mosses and liverworts um, that don't have a complex vascular system that gives them the structural support. Oh, okay. um, so it means not mosses. Non-vascular flora is a very different specialty. And there are people, there's actually people working on that at Mount Toby right now. Um, so the Another role I've had at UMAT, or at Mount Toby, in the course of my real job, is I get, had a, I got to play professor at UMass um, for a semester, and I taught a 400-level forestry course, and I got to use Mount Toby as what it was purchased for, which is a research forest for the university. Um, so I, and I go back every year and take a field trip with the students in the forestry department, which I'm supposed to schedule soon, actually. Um, so that's sort of the personal history that says what I've been doing in Mount Toby all of these years, which has been a compounding integration of my identity and my identity as a botanist and interaction with that landscape. Um, and, you know, 20 years is like, might be the perfect amount of time to really see changes in a forest and landscape. It's a, it's a nice round number, so we're stuck in this uh, you know, base 10 system. I think so, I really like the 17-year cicada as the, the <laughs> personally, but 20 is a nice round number. Last year, a year ago, it was 19 years, so you're getting the 20-year version. Uh, this is evidence that my kids actually used to go hiking with me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you know, and I really started, especially when I taught in 2018. I really started looking at it places in a different light. Like I'm going to use this as a classroom to take measurements of trees. And also, like, what are you actually seeing there when you're taking measurements? You're trying to take a snapshot in time so you can then take future measurements and compare them. And you can do that with your eyes, too, you know, and your brain. Uh, but so I was starting to see, like, wow, this place doesn't look like the first time I came here, those types of moments, over and over and over again. Um, and so the first part of this talk is going to sort of summarize some of those big processes that have shaped Mount Toby visibly and perceptibly in the past 20 years. 
um, one of the biggest ones, this is not meant to be doom and gloom, but one of the oh. biggest patterns is the decline of hemlock from yeah. these two exotic insect pests. On the left, these little cotton balls, some of yeah. you may know this, hemlock woolly adelgia is a little insect in there that draws sap from the twig, or it's actually the base of the needle. And then the needle is compromised and it sheds prematurely. Same thing on the right, you can see these little brown ovals on the underside of the needles. That's another insect, it's called elongate hemlock scale. So that's a scale that covers an insect that does the same thing. It's sucking juices out of the needle, well, eventually compromises the needle and sheds it prematurely. And the, process, the effect is the crown of this hemlock, which is when I moved to Amherst, there these nice, beautiful, dark green, deep crowned hemlocks extremely dense shade, very cool in the understory, and they just thin and thin and thin until they look gray and sickly, and they don't look like the grand hemlock tree that I first learned when I moved out here. Um, they might still be alive, but then, and then but some of them, at least especially in the last five years, have started uh, dying off sort of gradually, unfortunately. And so this is a pro very long process that's been escalating over time. Um, one of the most conspicuous ways, uh, con conspicuous ways to see hemlock decline is what I call the red death, which is very visible in winter. Um, and the tree is either dead or nearly dead, and secondary insects, invade bark beetles, things like that, invade the tree in great numbers, and then the woodpeckers work over the woodpeckers and nuthatches and brown creepers work over the tree and flake off the bark and leave this huge pile of hemlock bark mulch, basically at the base of the tree. Um, and then this, the underbark is it's more vibrant than it shows up here. It's sort of this brick red almost, sometimes even a, a mauve or magenta, depending on the light. Um, so this is something I've been seeing the red death for a de decade at least in October. There's still a ton of hemlock there. Um, it's the third most abundant tree in the state. I think that probably holds true at Toby, and it's probably still true. It's just extremely abundant, and it's, I, have, I don't have time to get into it, but I think in places it's artificially abundant due to the past, how the woods were logged in the past 100, 150 years ago, but um, that's speculation. Um, what's the consequence we're dealing with right now? Um, so because this happens very slowly, it's basically one needle at a time, it's compromised and drops off, not it's needle by needle, thinning of the crown. Um, is that you really have a thinning effect. You know, this dense canopy of shade is just begins to percolate with little pinpricks of light, and you have a change in the understory light regime until you have, I guess you might not know what you're looking at yet, but all these little sticks here are black birch seedlings that are coming in. This is with the trail called the Hemlock Loop Trail, um, which is full of dead hemlocks now, and, um, but it's basically transitioning this forest into a black birch dominated forest very slowly, over 20 years. So this is still mostly hem, it's plenty of living hemlock, mostly hemlock in the river story, but it has these 15, 18 year old black birch saplings gradually filling into the understory, um, taking the place of the, the previous occupants. Excuse me. Um, and that's a pattern that's seen throughout Western Mass in Black Arch, but Mount Toby is special. Um, and in other places, it sort of gives us hints that maybe hemlock wasn't so, hemlock, because it so, creates such a dense shade, it tends to exclude things that want to grow in the other store. Um, so there's hints that maybe it wasn't so abundant even in the last 100 or 200 years. Um, this is on some ledges in the sugar farms area, which is on the west side. Um, and this whole, all the yellow in the understory are sugar maple seedlings oh. about knee high. Um, and there's blue cohosh and some other rich forest herbs, and sedges that are coming in that were never there. You know, this is actually most, this is half hemlock, half sugar maple. This is a sugar maple here and this one here. Um, it tells me that the hemlock is sort of a recent arrival that muted some of those other floristic components. And now that it's succumbing, those are still in the seed bank to come back and it's almost like an ecological restoration of this community, depending on the place. Um, 
weren't there chestnuts there just before? Chestnut, that's a complex question. There was some chestnut. It depends on the site. That's a, that's going to be a very long diversion. Talking about chestnut. <laughs> um, depends on the site. Um, for example, this is an example of a place there probably was a chestnut. So this is up the Roaring Brook Valley. This, when I first started hiking up there, the Tower Road goes right up. This was a, what I call a hemlock desert. Just moss and needles the whole way up as far as you can see. Um, and now maybe 15 or 20 percent of the hemlocks have died or are very thin. And this, the whole hillside is green. It's actually a little crease in the hillside. And there's a, some seepage that comes in there. And there's a ton of black blue cohosh and some baneberry, some of these really what they call rich mesic forest herbs. Then, and if you, let me come on this side here. So the residual trees, this is a yellow birch here. This is a white ash. I'm sorry, this is a sugar maple. White ash, yellow birch. This is actually a, what we call a rich mesic northern hardwood forest, which uh, is more common in the birch here. This is more like a Mount Greylock forest. Um, that, again, was that herbaceous component was suppressed by the shade of the hemlock and is now reemerging. Uh, so there's some mixed results with hemlock decline. Um, another example of it's not all bad is this rare flower here. This is a, gosh, what is it called? Luckily I wrote it down. Allegheny vine, climbing fumatory, has other names. And uh, this, is a, this is the only time I've ever seen this plant flower. And it was grown, it's a, it's a biennial vine. It's a fly dormant in the sea bank for a long time. Known for Mount Toby. Um, and it was growing on a dead snapped off hemlock in the middle of a sunny opening. And it was maybe 30 feet long, scrambling wow. up. It's a very vigorous vine, full of flowers. And I've never seen it. I've been to this exact same spot several times, and I haven't seen it since. Um, so it was responding to that moment, that moment where the, suddenly the sun is on the floor enough and it does its thing and repopulates re the seed bank with its, with its seeds. Um, so that's our forests of our have seen this before as sort of a, a lesson. Um, so that's hemlock. Another. Yes. How long can these can seeds stay dormant? <laughs> that's a hard question to answer. Depends on the species. Uh, violets are supposed to be up to a century or more. Uh -huh. so, um, it's hard to study that. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a it's easy to exaggerate too. <laughs> It's, you know, it's like anything else. You start with so many, and over time, the viability, probability of viability declines until maybe it's never zero, but it gets near zero. Um, so the next big pattern, which is, this is, we'll use this as an illustration of a broader pattern. Ice, this is the first time I really noticed the effects of wind disturbance at Toby. Um, and this doesn't, I say ice storm, you think the ice storm did this, but it was actually the wind that came with it. Anybody was in the area at the time. It rained, it rained, it rained. The ground wasn't frozen. It was in December. And then the ice came back. This magic elevation, which wasn't very much higher than the valley here. Even if you get up into Leverett a little bit, it was this heavy ice layer. Um, and then this south, big south wind came rushing up the valley and jumped over the valley, into the Roaring Brook Valley. Um, and what happened in 08, the hemlocks still had enough needles and they grow on steep slopes there, so the, their crowns are very asymmetrical. The downhill side is very deep, and the uphill side is a little abbreviated. And hemlock, because it has a lot of evergreen needles, collects a lot of ice on its branches. And they were very top heavy, and that wind came. And ordinarily, we think of wind comes and it blows down in the direction of the wind, but what actually happened is those trees all fell straight downhill in the direction of their lopsided crowns. Um, and it's visible on an aerial photo, this sort of Swiss cheese mosaic and some of, some of the older hemlock forests in that Roaring Brook Valley. Um, and I've been poking around there, almost breaking my leg, trying to see how this is evolving. It's like a perfect natural experiment of what foresters say they emulate, this, this uh, wind disturbance that knocks over groups of trees. And then something has to start from scratch. Um, I think most of these are from the last year or two. Um, wow. This is one of the bigger ones. You know, this is to walk through this is not. Um, it's, it's easier than it used to be because things have settled down. But um, it's still a, a bit of an acrobatic exercise. 
Is that um, off the Jeep trail, the main trail? It's off the Tower Road, yes. You can see it. There's some sunny gaps right up the road there. And some of them are up to upwards of around three quarters of an acre or so. Um, so mostly black birch, but there's also um, fire cherry or pin cherry, white birch, poplar, um, some red oak coming up right in the middle, just like a silvicultural forester might have expected. Um, and then some shadier things on the edges, even, even hemlock coming in. Um, so we're getting the sort of the diversity of Massachusetts forests coming into this disturbance gap, which has been endlessly fascinating for me um, to sort of examine. Um, and you know, so 2008, what are we at? Let's see, it's 15 years ago or something. Yeah. Um, and this is, I took this last winter in the middle of one of the biggest ones. And it's basically a forest, and it's 20 to 25 feet tall. All the players are there. Some of them will thin out, and there'll be winners and losers, but it's already getting back to being a forest in 13 years. It's uh, this, with a bunch of the diversity you would expect in southern New England. Um, this is really part of a much broader pattern of uh, what I call canopy gap dynamics, which is basically wind beating up the prominence of Mount Toby. Like you said in the intro, it sits about 1,000 feet up from this big flat bottom of the valley. And when the wind comes, usually from the northwest or from the, the west in the summer, um, it, uh, it has an effect. <laughs> this is one on the very, the very west side of Toby proper. It's very steep. And it, it kind of acts like the side of a ship's hull. You know, the wind slams up against it, um, especially if it comes off. You know, there's the sugar loaf right there. Um, and this is, uh, when I found this, it was I don't know what the wind event was, but the trees are probably 15 to 20 years old. Um, so maybe it was a s summer storm the year I showed up on campus here. Um, and it was maybe half an acre of trees that had blown down and were rotting and nearly gone. And all of this birch and maple and other things were coming up. And just testament to something happened and nobody was there to see it. So a bunch of trees fell down and uh, nobody was there to hear, so to speak. Uh, here's another little patch that made the news um, because people lost power in Montague <laughs> in Sunderland. Um, but this is in the middle of nowhere, no trail nearby. Just happened to be cutting over. This is in the northwest corner of the Robert Frost Trail and uh, Reservation Road. Just happened to be cutting over between two trails, and I saw this big sunny gap. And sure enough, it was, this was a summer downburst storm that knocked a bunch of trees over again. Uh, uprooted. Summer up, you know, wet soils, summer uprooting is very, seems to be the more common than wind snapping. Uh, let's see. This, you know, just this week I took a walk at Roaring Mountain and, you know, remember it was windy the, what, last month? Yeah, <laughs> it was really rainy and it was really windy. Um, all over Roaring Mountain are little groups of trees that just blew over within the last month, um, including some, some smaller ones. Um, and you can tell it was really recent because the mud from the uh, house has only recently started dissolving. Yeah. Um, so this is such a pervasive but low in let's see, let's see, how do I see this? Um, low density but high intensity uh -huh. <laughs> disturbance. So maybe le much less than one percent of the landscape on the Toby Mass of the year is being affected by this. Um, but it's a constant massaging of the overstory that brings in other, other trees into the community. Um, let me go back. One thing about this hillside is it looks traumatic right now because there's a single event that knocked down dozens and dozens of trees. But as you look at the hillside, you'll see a tree that probably blew down 10 years ago that's in a state of decay, and another tree that was from 25 years ago that's in a different state of decay. And then the whole hillside is actually just a bunch of pits and mounds from thousands of years of trees blowing over on Mount Toby. Um, so it's, the pervasiveness of this effect is, uh, is really profound, and it's been shaping the mountain for as long as it's been there. Um, not all trees blow over. <laughs> uh, and actually, some of the tree bigger, the biggest hemlocks I've ever seen in Massachusetts died of old age. Um, and they're right off, they were right off of the Tower Road, not far, but you would be easy to miss them. Um, there's an area called the Rhodes Natural Area. There's a, there's, I think there's a boulder there. It says Rhodes Natural Area. It's named after Arthur Rhodes. He's a forestry professor at Mass in the mid in the 20th century. Um, and it was a study here. He said he sort of 
championing the idea of setting it aside as what we now call maybe an old growth reserve or uh, to study late seral dynamics or something academic sounding. Um, but it's basically an, old, an older stand of trees that hadn't been exploited by the timber industry in the 19th century it had different attributes. There are some old growth patches embedded in that and included some of these trees. Um, and watching an old tree, a little giant old tree senesce is like another natural experiment. That's, uh, you get to imagine how this happened for thousands of years. Um, and it's a, another similar scenario where you see all the, uh, what I call the supplicants, all the young trees that come around and are waiting for the, <laughs> for the sunshine, and they don't, you know, not, they don't mourn in a moment. I don't think they, uh, they're looking for the sky. Um, but you have these really profound structures that are like a playground for insects and, and, and uh, rodents and birds that have a role in the system. <laughs> Um, these happened all three B hemlocks. I think the one in the center was the big, the biggest tree, so to speak. It was barely alive when I first saw it, and that was almost 20 years ago. Um, there's another. Not all the old trees are big at Pronto for complex reasons, but um, the big ones get everybody's attention, of course. There's another group of big trees that are not hemlocks on the other side of the mountain. So the, the west side, there are or were. Lots of giant old sugar maples. Um, and I remember the first winter I hiked through there, I measured some sugar maples that were just enormous. Just Are they old growth? So the, this is, they seem like they should be old growth. But, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. The thing about sugar maple is they rot really quickly. So some of the ones that I saw 15 to 20 years ago, I can't find them again. Like you'll see, see this the bottom of this stump will rot away, and there'll be like a blackened, rotten maple stump for a while. But the tree itself seems to disappear. The maple is very it's not very heat resistant, um, and they seem like old growth. But except for we have some historical data and some observational floristic data in my mind that uh, points to a, a more agricultural origin. Um, which is tied to this thing here, which you probably might have hiked by, the sugar farms area. Um, and if you read the history of Swampfield, aka something on the Swampfield Historical Society, it's a great discussion of the importance of the sugar industry and how important Mount Hobie was for the sugar industry, especially after the revolution when we were trying to wean ourselves off of English imported sugar. The maple sugar industry was the sugar, domestic sugar product. Um, and all the way, not all the way up the mountain, but significantly further up the mountain than this uh, where was managed sugar bush. And so a lot of these big old trees were sugar bush. And successively, as happens with sugar bushes, with each generation that seems to pass, um, each terrace sort of pulled back and back, and now there's, there's no tapping of sugar bushes. This, I don't know when the last time this, this uh, building was used to boil sap. Um, so it's peeled back, and we have the legacy of these big old trees, probably dating to mid-19th century, some of them, that are now senescing, and they're surrounded by really young sugar maple forests. Actually, do I have a picture? Oh, I have a, di I have a diversion before we get to the picture of the maple forest. Um, you know, when you're at Amherst, you, do, you think of, you talk about Amherst things, so. Um, another one of my... Uh, <laughs> Obsessions turned avocation is uh, Emily Dickinson's plants and her natural observations that place her into the landscape. Um, so I naturally have this thought of, of did she go to Mount Toby? She has all sorts of plants in her herbarium that could have been from there. Um, and we do have proof that she went to Sunderland. Or at least an anecdote. This is a great Emily Fowler Ford letter. This is what she wrote to Mabel Lewis Todd, which is appropriate to cite Mabel Lewis Todd for historical society. Um, with probably the best anecdote of Emily Dickinson as a person and a social uh, person connected to the landscape. Um, not only did she tell us she went to Mount Norwalk and collected plants, but she also said she went to this sugaring off in Sunderland. And they said, well, it's Mount Toby's in Sunderland. That's, that's a good clue. But thankfully, um, Emily tells us herself she went sugaring also. And she gives us a bunch of uh, sort of nondescript natural things. She talks about moss and acorn, and 
then she mentions this little snail shell that she picked up. She wrote this letter to uh, her, sis her sister-in-law, Susan, a very important person in her life. Um, and wouldn't she know, um, there's all sorts of little white snail shells all over Mount Toby that I've probably seen there, there in the Holyoke Range more than anything else. Um, and it's a, actually, it's a native terrestrial snail known as Eastern White Lip Snail. Um, and I've read one account that says snails are recycling or upcycling ancient calcium that's been stuck in the bedrock for millions or tens of millions of years. Um, and this is tied to what makes Toby special is the bedrock. That rich, it's got an enriching bedrock, what's called Mount Toby conglomerate. And the plants bring that out. In, well, bed, I guess the groundwater brings it out, and the plants bring it out. And the snails eat the plants and embody that calcium in their shells once again. Um, so you see this snail in places of rich bedrock. You see it in the Berkshires and limestone areas also. Um, so that's a clue that maybe this sugar bush, which you might have gone to, was at Mount Toby. Uh, one more diversion here. Um, you notice that there's a lot of place names at Mount Toby. Like, here's Gunbrook, here's the Gun Farm here. The Gunn's family still lives in Sunderland. And Emily's paternal grandmother was a Gunn from Montague. And her parents are buried in the cemetery just a mile up the road from here. Um, so she had family ties to, sh to families that were tapping sugar in Sunderland during her lifetime. So. And, uh, you know, wouldn't we like to know is how I yeah. have to say. Um, end of diatribe. <laughs> oh, I didn't have the picture of the sugar bush. I'm sorry. Um, I guess that, so that ends, I, that was an abrupt transition. I anticipate. Um, so that was the, uh, the sort of the processes side of the talk. And now we'll get into a little bit more of the specific plants. Um, I didn't mean for this to be a doom and gloom, but it's, uh, you know, one of the things oh, I didn't mention since since Robert, Robert was here. So uh, out of the Florida Franklin County project, which uh, the point I was getting to was that we realized Mount Toby was special, and after the completion of that, um, Robert Burton, who I mentioned earlier, is actually here now. Uh, we, we sort of emulated a process he had initiated in Mount Wachusett to do a, a specific floristic inventory of the mountain. Mount Wachusett was special in Worcester County flora. Toby emerged as a very special unit in Franklin County flora. And we're now in our third or fourth year of uh, intensive exploration of Toby, which you would thought, we thought we did a pretty good job <laughs> for the county flora. But lo and behold, um, you know, more things show up, the more intensive you use a different sampling intensity and different approach. Um, so we're doing systematic inventory of Mount Toby's flora. And in the process of that, you realize, you start to really get the fine-grained picture of things that aren't there anymore, or that we don't expect to find anymore. Um, so if, I'll just give you a few examples of what I dramatically call vanished taxa. This is one that's on my wish list. Um, Northern Wild Comfrey. Um, this map, this is a map of Franklin County, and the circle means we have a historical record, we have no current record. These are the maps that show up in the county of Florida. Um, only collected from Mount Toby. Supposedly, I think there's some note on one of the specimens that says, near the summit, which is <laughs> precisely <laughs> big. Um, I think there's one other extant population in Massachusetts, in the Berkshire, so in Berkshire County. Um, mysterious species, we don't know why it was, we just know that this is the value of uh, press specimens and natural history collections, is we know it was there. We have irrefutable proof that it was there, um, but we just haven't found it uh, again, and it's gone for some reason. It's a northern species. It likes rich, sort of, I want to say, boreal influence type sites. Another charismatic group of orchids. Um, this is the frog orchid, Coelogloson is what I think of it as. It's now put in Dactylorhiza. Um, this is a countywide disappearing act. You can see lots of historical records in Franklin County, only one current record in Coleraine. Um, this is part of a broader pattern of orchid decline in really across the Northeast and Midwest, maybe beyond. Is um, that deer, shade, or human collecting, or all of the above? All of the above, and probably then some. Oh, okay. Um, it's, I have a little sidebar on that momentarily, though. 
um, after this, another species emblematic of a group of declining species is, uh, this is, it's also called single delight, which is such a poetic little name for it. It's just maybe this tall. I've only seen it once in the Berkshires. Um, collected, again, many historical records in the county, only two current records. Um, and it was collected from Mount Toby. And I think this Leverett record might also be from Mount Toby. Um, but so the thing about the last two, this is in a group of, it's in the Heath family, or Casey, and it's in a subsection of that family called the Pyroloids, Pyroloidae. Um, and those, fa those plants are mycoheterotrophic, meaning they depend, at some point in their life cycle, they have obligate dependence on a soil fungus. And so do just about all the orchids in the Northeast. Um, and we, so subsequent to the flora, we also we looked at countywide patterns of change. And we looked at orchids, we looked at northern species, we looked at mycoheterotrophic plants. And I think, let me see, it's all three of those had statistically or near statistically significant differences in decline. They were declining <coughs> at a more rapid rate than rap other declines. Hopefully, I phrased that correct. <laughs> Being, I'm not being graded on this. Um, so the question comes up whether there's other there's other stresses, but some things with that the fungal dependence on the microheterotrophs is important. These happen to both be all three of these are northern taxa. <coughs> Two of them are microheterotrophic northern taxa. So something is changing the conditions that make them that they require to win. Conversely, did you have a question? No, oh, it's just sad. <laughs> um, other, the converse side of things is some things are at the southern end, or the northern end of the range. There are more southern species that reach, have reached their limit in this area. And things at the end of their range are vulnerable to change because they're pioneers, so to speak. Um, and we didn't see a significant difference in southern species declining at the county level. But there are some specific plants at Toby that are southern plants at their northern edge, more broadly speaking, that just haven't shown up again. And these are two that are extant in Massachusetts. The violet wood sorrel is really stunning. It's extant in the Holyoke Range, excuse me, and in Mount Tom. Uh, very rare was collected once in Mount Toby. It's a hard, the specimen's at Harvard, and I would love to find it again. <laughs> it's such a compelling plant. Um, this one on the right, uh, lyre-leaved rock cress, is the common name. This actually wasn't in our county flora because we didn't find this, or didn't encounter the specimen until a year or two ago. Um, it seems to be valid. This is extant in the Berkshires, and it's never been recorded in Franklin County. Somehow this specimen has eluded detection until recently. Um, another one, like Rich Bedrock, has found its way up the Champlain Valley into the Midwest. It was collected once and not seen again. Lots of suitable habitat. Um, another one, an orchid, one of the few orchids, native orchids I haven't seen yet, um, anywhere, is the putty root orchid, uh, which again, this is another disappearing act. Used to be extant on Toby so recently, I think we have a plus sign there because it was observed I think right at the start of our study period, 2010, and I went and surveyed for it a few years after. I think all of us have <laughs> surveyed it multiple times, and it's just gone. It was in a cage. It was just the let one down to one plant. Um, so no current records <coughs> in Franklin County. Uh, extant in the Holyoke Range. But it's a more southern, very, very common in the Midwest. It's, uh, so it's, it's vulnerable, and it hasn't pers persisted. Um, some of the other stressors, which you mentioned, is uh, our deer, which uh, you know can contribute to declines and things that aren't facing those other stressors. Um, this is a, these two photos are side by side. Um, this was 2019, I think, spring 2019. I went to a place I'd been before. I was looking for the purple clematis, which is a rare plant known from Mount Toby, that I saw with Karen Searcy in fruit never seen it in a flower. I still haven't seen it in a flower. I was going to look for it where we saw it and I stopped it in my tracks because these are orchid leaves. I know they're orchids. 
Um, and I was excited because I didn't know they were there. And this, this is on Ox Hill. And I came back two weeks later expecting to find this, which is, these plants are not from that location. This is, the showy orchis is, I took this in the Berkshires, and this is from a plant I found in Montague for the county for it. Um, but instead, I just found a bunch of leaves and a couple, <laughs> a couple stems that happened to them. You know, I don't have a picture of the lady slipper because there was nothing, not even a nub there. And they needed everything else, all the ginger and all these other plants. So um, that's a really intense level of browse to, to put up <coughs> year after year after year. And even within the 10 years of the county flora, I think the group agreed deer browse intensity appeared to increase. Definitely in my 20 years span there, the deer, even though pre-botany, I used to go to Mount Toby and track deer and just you know, hike through the woods and see what they're up to. Now I'm not as amused by the <laughs> <laughs> occupations of deer. So lots of, those, that's another prevalent threat that certain taxa, which, some of which I'll talk about briefly, um, face more than others. Uh, all right, let's get back into some, let's get down into some specific groups of plants. Toby most seems to be a, in the public consciousness that non Toby is a fern destination. And this is perpetuated, somebody mentioned before the, show, the talk, the uh, Pioneer Valley Fern Society, um, which is Janice Stone and Randy Stone put together. Um, and I, I've known them since before then, but um, there are a lot of ferns there. I went through the county flora, and we have 30, I believe, 35 extant species in Mount Toby, more broadly speaking. A couple that are historical, one might be historical, meaning they've been observed in the past and we didn't observe them again, but could still be there. <coughs> um, and that doesn't even include hybrids and wood ferns and fern relatives and all these other weird things that. Um, so, you know, it's for people that are interested in spore-bearing spore plants, uh, it still is a pretty good destination. Um, this is another of Kate Spencer's paintings that, you know, we'll start by entering into Kate's painting. <laughs> Just start talking about a subset of ferns that I happen to have halfway decent pictures of. Um, right in the middle, this is Roaring Falls, I'm sure, hopefully, many of you have been there. Right in the middle somewhere, there's a boulder that's escaped toddlers and intoxicated college students um, that still has a little bit of this walking fern. It's a very weird fern that has these long points and it roots at the node, so it tends, it looks like it's walking, so it, its tip roots and creates another cluster of ferns. Um, it's very weird, uh, and it's still there. And it's, it's great that it's still there because it's so easily accessible. You can bring a class there and you say, look at this, this is, you won't see this everywhere. Um, there are some better clumps of it elsewhere on the mountain with less traffic. Um, that's in, in the spleen or genus of spleen. Let's see. Oh, see. So then Roaring Falls itself is a very damp, rich habitat. Again, similar to like the Grey Lock area. Um, and there's some great rich mesic woods ferns in that area. Um, the two char characteristic ones are maidenhair fern on the left and the silvery glade fern on the right. Um, Glade fern, I, I say it has, the spores are underneath, they look like little spore tacos, uh, like this herringbone pattern. That's extremely common in Berkshire County. That's sort of the first, that's my first indication of this rich influence in the groundwater, is when I see this fern. Um, they're not rare, but they tell you something about the site. Um, if you go further down the, the rocks there, there's two more special ferns. Um, this one on the left is Goldie's Fern, which I call the Hercules of the wood ferns. It's, it can be this big, and it's, it's, it's quite robust. Um, and usually, almost always growing with it, is this other glade fern, the glade fern, which has these dagger-shaped pinions, is what they call uh, the leaves there. Um, and they t even, they're more common in the Berkshires, but even in the Berkshires, they're pretty special. And they're still on the state watch list because they seem like they should be more abundant, but they're not. And it's kind of unclear why. Um, might be sensitive to disturbances, might be sensitive to past land use. Really don't know. Um, another one, I'm not sure if it's at Roaring Falls, but elsewhere on the mountain in these really rich, damp pockets, borderline wetland, um, is this another beefy fern, 
muscular fern is the, the broad beach fern. It's a very common narrow beach fern. When you see the broad beach fern, which has these really, the bottom two leaflets, I guess I'll call them for the, this, are almost as big as the rest of the fern, um, which is, it gives it this really strange triangular shape. Um, that is another one that pretty much everywhere I've seen that, I've found something rare or very interesting in that community. Uh, including at Mount Toby, whether it's an orchid or some other strange plant that needs richness and something in the humus. So those are the ferns to keep an eye out for. Um, there's lots of rocks at Mount Toby, not surprisingly, being a bedrock dominated mountain. Um, the first, so rocks can either be this way, which we call cliffs or ledges, and sometimes they're this way, which we call outcrops. Um, Cliffs and ledges have more spleenworts. This is the most common one, maiden here spleenwort, which you can see going if you go to Rory Falls or just a, any rock, you might see maiden here spleenwort. Um, and the, its rare cousin, the wall rose spleenwort, which in other parts of the world grows in masonry walls. I'm still waiting for that to manifest here. Um, it's very rare on Toby. I've seen it maybe once or twice. It's, it's there's all manner of cliffs. There's dry cliffs, wet cliffs, steep cliffs, short cliffs, and every one is different. Um, so some of them have that, that fern, and many others don't. Um, if you tilt the rock over to outcrop, or even just rocky substrate, um, you get a different group of ferns. Another spleenwort, ebony spleenwort, is very common in these dry hilltop, rich hilltop settings. Um, it's more upright than it's the maiden ears spleenwort. And once you hit a certain threshold of filtered light, you can get some of this rusty woodsia and its cousin, smooth the other woodsia, which has its common name that I can't think of. Um, but if you go like in Bull Hill area, south facing slope, um, filtered canopy, and you get just enough light where this fern takes over the rocks in places. Um, there's also some significant oddballs in Mount Toby. What happens when you have the diversity, you get the whole cast of characters. Um, does anybody see the fern? <laughs> <laughs> You're looking at that green stuff, which is, this is zoomed in. That's, this is it. This is one of the weirdest ferns in, in our flora. Uh, Appalachian bristle fern. Um, and some of you may know this. Ferns have two stages in their life cycle. They exist as a gametophyte. And then the gametophytes produce sexual propagules and cross, and then create a sporophyte, which is what we think of as a fern. This is a species that is stuck in its gametophyte phase and never produces a sporophyte. That's just a complete mystery as to why or how it exists, or how long it's existed this way. Um, so, and it just grows in the darkest places where there's, you wouldn't think there was enough light to photosynthesize. And I've only seen it. I don't like to poke my head in tight spaces. So, but I found enough caves that have enough breathing room for me to get in far enough and prove that it's there. And I actually just documented this in the Holyoke Range for the first time this winter. Um, another weird group of plants, since eclipse is on Monday, the moon warts. I don't know if that's anything to do with the moon, but the last eclipse, I found tons of moon warts. It was in 2018 or 2019. I was out in the woods on the day of the eclipse, and there was moon warts popping up everywhere. Um, just put that in the, um, the universe to see if it means anything. Um, this was, we only had two current records in the county, and this was the plant I found. It's the tiniest little thing that grows in bare leaf litter. And it was known from Mount Toby, and I found it in a place Complete opposite side of the mountain, and we never found it where it had been found before. Um, this was the product of going on a hike by myself on Father's Day, which is a perfect Father's Day gift to yourself. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, get into a few more community, so things that make Mount Toby special that are more about the plants. Um, this is true of the Holyoke Range, too. But the Hickory Hop Hornbeam Forest is really what makes Pioneer Valley botanically fascinating. And the examples at Mount Toby are different, than some, or they have similarities, but they're unique from other hickory hop forming forests in the valley, like the Holyoke Range. Um, it's also a misnomer. Hickory is a tree, hop hornbeam is a tree. But they're actually really diverse hardwood forests, which are 
broadly in the oak hickory type. Uh, most of the trees with colorful foliage here are sugar maple. And right on the top of the hill, very shallow bedrock, drought prone. You don't think of sugar maple. There's sugar maple. There's basswood. There's white ash. Um, several oak species, several hickory species, and others. Uh, what's that? This is, this is the top of Ox Hill, which has no trail right. to it. That's, but it's, uh, that's why it's nice. <laughs> Um, these trees are actually very old, much older than they look. Um, so I'll just give you a smattering of some of the botanical diversity of these forests, which what I realized as I prepared this last year is that the understory of these forests is actually kind of like a grassland with not just grasses, grasses, sedges, and forbs that are flowering pretty much from now all the way until through the uh, asters and golden nuts. So there's something flowering in the understory of these forests the whole summer long, the whole growing season. Um, so you know, we think about meadows and pollinator habitat all the time now, but we have forests that fulfill that function, and many of them are degraded. These are examples of non-degraded systems that are providing excellent pollinator habitat. Um, there's our hop hornbeam. The seeds look like hops superficially. Um, or the sedges are very diverse in these communities. Uh, this is a characteristic one, just as, as a stand-in, Cephalophora, sometimes called button sedge. Um, and this little milkweed is, is uh, you don't think of milkweeds as being in the understory of the forest either. This is a little ankle-high milkweed that flowers in June that you can see it when you go hike around the Bull Hill ledges off Bull Hill Road. It's uh, one of the things that jumps out at you is, huh, What's that doing here? This is not typical of my walk in the forest. Uh, another trio here. This, this is another uh, icon of hickory hop horn beams, the palm leaf violet, with these really distinctive hand-shaped leaves. Liking diversity is pretty high for understory in these forests, too. This is a used to be listed, it's a watch listed bush clover that is fairly common places on not to be include Ox Hill. And another one that tells you you're in, you know, people familiar with wild oats, it's this little yellow flower. That's a very common flower. This is a cousin to wild oats that really is, again, tells you something different is going on in the bedrock. There's something, some nutrient level there that is more significant. Um, and you can see that, you can see a transition from boring old wild oats to its more interesting cousin uh, when you walk into these places, and if you're receptive to that, you're you isolated. <coughs> My um, parasitic plants are also pretty well represented. Um, this is bear corn, parasitic on the roots of oak, oak trees, and that's cancer root, which is a more general parasite. Um, parasites do well when trees are suffering. Um, after the spongy moth defoliation, the oil patch, both of these. Their populations, I don't know if they increased, but they became more obvious. So parasites can exist out of sight for a while until the opportunity arises. Um, these are some hemi parasites, so they're photosynthetic plants that at least part of their nutrients are derived from a parasitic relationship. This false foxglove, hemi parasitic on oak. Um, unfortunately, these are another deer candy group, and it's used to find all three species perforated through the understory, and it's hard to find one that hasn't been browsed <coughs> three or four times in this growing season. They eventually create some flowers late in the season, but you know it's not what they used to be. Um, so there are some rare things that are not necessarily what most people look for, but um, the mustards are a group that are really interesting, but not necessarily. This is as showy as a mustard gets, this is the rosette. Um, there are four different species in this genus on Toby. Two of them are listed as rare. One is watchless. Um, and they really they're just keyed into that bedrock, Same, similar to my Holyoke. Um, and this hawthorn, this was actually historic for the state, and Karen Searcy found it in 2013, collected it from Bull Hill, I think, um, which brought it back into the extant flora of Massachusetts. 
Um, and I subsequently found it in the Holyoke Range, where Karen had done intensive floristic study. Um, and we found it elsewhere in, the town, in Franklin County also. So this is another one. Hawthorns you think of as hedgerow, big, gnarly hedgerow trees. But there's a subset that like to grow in the understories of these really rich, rocky forests. All right, I'm getting long-winded, but we're in the final stretch here, which, not to bore you, is uh, what I think is the sort of the most fascinating part of Mount Toby, which is embedded within this hickory hop hornbeam forest type, which is the diversity of grasses. And this is really, you know you're a botanist. <laughs> so you get excited about grasses. Um, and this is, of grasses, this is the first one I ever said, I need to take that home and find out what it is. And this is bottle brush grass. It's very, you know, it can be, four feet tall, it's maybe a couple inches diameter. It's very conspicuous if you happen to walk by it. Um, you say, that's unusual. That doesn't look like other grasses. Um, that's sort of one of the keystone species of these, these communities that tells you you're in a rich bedrock zone. Um, the irony, some of, a lot of the hilltops look like this on the right. You might think, oh, that was probably a pasture. It looks like a lawn. Um, and the irony of this slide is that most of that green is not grass at all. It's sedges, um, but punctuated within, again, this is like, like a grassland. There's a matrix of graminoids, and within that are all these different flowering plants and, uh, and grasses in between. Where is that on the right? That, I think, is part of Roaring Mountain. It's a lot of it. This Roaring Mountain is yeah. very lumpy, but there's some glades like that on the periphery of it. Not the, not the summit of it, but on the outskirts. Mm. Um, so I have, grasses are hard to photograph, but I have enough for a few of my favorites. Uh, this is probably one of my favorites. I guess I'd say that about many of them. Hairy brome. Um, Bromus is one of those archetypal grass genera. It takes this very wheat-like spike lit that has, it looks like something you might want to cultivate as a grain. Um, it's very attractive, has these big arching spikes, it's very tall, conspicuous, and I, once you get an eye for it, you can find it in the winter, um, at least the remnants of it, and if I find it in the winter, I say, I need to come back here, because this tells me there's something else growing here that's interesting. Um, one of our earliest flowering plants in these forests is a grass, this white green rice grass, which is probably flowering right now, um, and then it Kind of fades into the background, uh, creates a little rice like grain, and it has a cousin that's later growth flowers later in the season, the black cedar rice grass, that is very abundant in all, in all these rich wood habitats. Um, the last group are a couple of rare ones. This is advanced botany, so when you get into the, <coughs> to borrow another Dickinsonian phrase, a little gorgeous nothing to the understory. Um, <laughs> that they just look like nothing. You know, it's, this is actually a bluegrass in the Grunchinus poa. It looks like the stuff you can seed your lawn if you stop mowing your lawn. You get bluegrass going to seed, um, but it looks flimsy and apoperate, and it grows in little straggly clumps. But why isn't it everywhere? It's just it's this mystery of like, why is it only in these little clumps and not all over this mountain? So the grasses are, know something about the history of the site and what they need that we don't know. And, but only by following it over a long period of time, you start to piece together what it is that we don't understand about it. Um, usually with it is another one that looks might look exactly the same to you. Um, this shining wedge grass, both of these are listed and protected in mass, both on the Holyoke Range and at Mount Toby. Um, and that's the end of the specifics, and I could talk, I could, could have done just slideshows and naming plants, which would have been a lot less interesting for everybody, but um, you know, there's, there's plenty to see there, and it's always changing, and I hope I have another 20 years to go to Mount Toby so I can see um, what it's going to be like, and I can come tell you about that. Yeah. <laughs> All right, this one last place. Happy to answer questions. We went over an hour, so I'm going to stick around. Yes. Is there a book that you recommend 
to take with you to Mount Toby to identify plants and especially flowers? Ooh. I'd say the still, my favorite still is the Newcomb's Wildflower Guide. Newcomb, N-E-W-C-O-M-B. It's some of the nomenclature is outdated, but the plants haven't changed. <laughs> and the structure of it is it's very attainable. Um, and it's, it's not comprehensive, it's, it's, it's extremely user friendly. Okay. And it's still in print? I believe so, yes. So it's specific to this area? It's no. northeast. I think it goes, it's in co it covers more than New England. Oh. Um, so it's, it's, it's not comprehensive, but it's pretty, it's pretty good. Great, thank you. Um, well, um, there's also a website called Go Botany. Um, that is the, basically the floor of New England. It has photos and it doesn't, ha it might not be user friendly to identify plants, but it helps you. If you have a hunch, you can search for the plant on that website and you'll see the images of it and where, a map of where it's been recorded. Pieces to the puzzle. Okay. Thank yes. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I've heard that Mount Toby has is one of the most biodiverse places in the region. Is that true? I would call it botanically speaking, it's definitely a hot spot. Oh, okay. um, and there are the Connecticut River Valley, the ridges in the Connecticut Valley are botanical hot spots overall. Mm -hmm. um, Partly because they're where they are in the valley. The species have been migrating south and north, and they tend to follow major river valleys. And they're also really rich bedrock, so there's high diversity from that. And they're dynamic because of all these factors that change the overstory. So those all contribute to high plant diversity. I don't know about that. I can't speak to other taxonomic groups, though. Yeah. It's special. <laughs> Yes. Um, first of all, thanks so much for a great talk. You're welcome. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I've been meaning to explore Mount Toby for a few years. I've heard a lot about it. I'm not really sure where to get started. Like, can you um, recommend um, any spots to start a hike, particularly if you're interested in the, the rich music sites? So Those sound really interesting. Yes. So rich music, going up the Roaring Brook Valley on the Tower Road yeah. is, a, is a pretty safe bet. Um, so that's very shady and damp. The long Roaring the Brook runs along the center of it in the Tower Road. You can't get lost. And you don't have to go far off the trail. You'll see, let's see, you know, trout, uh, let's see, red trillium, uh, blue cohosh, baneberry, these characteristic things, and the ferns. Um, they're more or less all right there. No, it's really starting at Roaring Falls. I don't have, I don't, I don't have a map. I know, but, uh, you say starting at Roaring Falls. If you start at Roaring Falls up. and go straight up, which is <laughs> just, I don't, I don't, I don't okay. want to go that far. Or, or you know, park on Reservation Road and follow the Tower Road up. And once you go up that Roaring Brook Valley, like the, then uh, you'll start to see those interesting things. Are the trails marked? I mean, do they have signs saying this is Tower Road, this is this, or I don't, I don't know, know where you're going. Really. Tower Road is a road. Oh, that's the main chief road. Oh, so it's a dirt and gravel. It goes to the fire. Vehicles go up to the top of the truck. Yes. Well, they must get to this one. It's pretty good blazing on the trails. That's right. And there's a map online. There's one question back there for you. Hi, I'm Shoshana King. I'm with the Amherst Public Shake Tree Committee. And, um, We've been um, experiencing a lot of loss of our sugar maples on our um, on our public trees. How have sugar maples been doing on that? Tree? Sugar maples, besides the old senescent sugar bush trees from the 19th century, I'd say they're doing really well. You know, they're, they're they're not experiencing. You know, shade trees suffer from salt and compaction and limited root zones, which the forest trees don't have to. Sugar maple likes to be buffered from drought for the most part, unless it, unless it germinated on a site that's drought prone and has lived for that its entire life. Um, so it tends to grow in damp sites that are buffered from drought. And as long as it has nutrients and moisture, they usually do pretty well. So 
That's my, my observation. I wanted to say something about hemlocks. I, I understand what you're saying about when they go down, other things come up, etc. But it has been for me a real tragedy watching in the last 20 or more years as they died. And there used to be huge ones on that audio. They're almost all dead. When I go up to Buffum Falls in Pelham, the ones that were still alive are being blown over. They're breaking oh. off about 20 or 30 feet up. About four or five of them died in the past year, you know, because you can see. And the ones at UMass are almost all dead. Mm -hmm. We're close to, et cetera. It's really Yes, I, I guess I, I, I don't mean to say you don't like hemlocks, <laughs> but, and I understand that there is a, you know, an ongoing process and whatever, but it's really... No, it's catastrophic. It, yeah, it's, it's short time. Yes, yeah. it's, you know, we talk a lot about carbon storage and oh, yeah. you know, yeah. and it's, that but, is a dramatic reduction in carbon storage. And the birds and animals that depended on them for winter shelter yeah. and food and everything else. It's yeah, it's a keystone, the third most abundant species in the state to decline. Yeah. It, it, it could be worse if it were more precipitous. But, uh, you know, that's the, the one grace is that it's been a very gradual um, transition. I wish the true kinglets would eat the adelphians. <laughs> <laughs> a huge population of kinglets. Each she had one first. So. Yeah, I, I just wondered, so what is the history of logging in that? You know, when was it all cut down? Well, the, you know, the thinking of the three peaks, the main bulk of the Toby, I think mo nearly all of it was cut over in the 19th century. Um, there was some logging into the early 20th century, and then there's a person who owned the bulk of it that then donated to UMass, I think, had, had some logging done that went to UMass. And then Chestnut Light came, and there was a Forest Service researcher stationed at UMass at the time that put in plots and did experimental forestry. Um, so they did some salvage logging of chestnut, and then some experimental planting of white pine to see if it would replace chestnut, which mostly failed. Um, because it's their hardwood, what we call hardwood sites. White pine can't really compete as vigorously with, with hickory and maple and things. So. Um, so there's most of the demonstration forestry has been pretty light footprint in the last hundred years. I think it was, I want to say it was 1918 or 24 or somewhere around there that we over. Um, but it was, it was an, ex, an era of exploitation. So it basically was clear cut in that. Probably, yes, probably. Probably clear cut. Yeah. And there was some agricultural. The foothills were mostly cleared for agriculture. There was at least, you know, there's the upper link trail between Oxon and Toby proper. There is a homestead site in that little valley. So there was some little settlements in the hills itself. Oh. So, so I just had one other question, which was with regard to the deer population. Is there any, you know, effort or thoughts about controlling the deer population um, has or the floristic? Has benefits <laughs> has what increased a lot? The deer population. Oh, yeah, yeah. Deer definitely has increased. I mean, as far as I know, the state sets harvest limits with hunting, and that's how they manage the deer herd. It's uh, by issuing doe permits, which is controversial for other reasons. But, um, it's uh, I don't know. It's, it's not as bad as other parts of the Northeast. <laughs> Because yeah. I know that I mean, they'll eat all the trilliums. They don't. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. They don't like. It's interesting. They don't like the jack in the pulpit, but the bear like the jack in the pulpit. <laughs> oh, so geez. yeah, the bear. I've had bear in my backyard eat all the jack in the pulpit. <laughs> oh, heard that. So yeah. Um, Do you know anything about the hurricane of '38 in Toby? Oh, interesting. I do. I know a little bit. So Cranberry Pond was impounded. There was a bog pond there, and it was impounded for the purpose of storing salvage logs oh, yeah. from the hurricane. Because so, I would assume it must have blown over a lot of trees yeah. on the southern side. I don't know about the extent of it. I know on that north, so there's a bunch of sandy outwash around the primary pond towards the reservation road that had been intentionally managed for pine, and a lot of that blew over. So there was deliberate salvage and replanting. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of plantation. There's white pine, larch, red pine, 
in that area. So and there's still some logs that pop up from the salvage once in a while. So that's a salvage. Uh, that's old cranberry pond is there. What's that? I mean, that's the beginning of cranberry pond. There was a cranberry pond there, but it was a kettle hole pond. So you, you can look at the, uh, the, I don't know, the, the, the depth map, and you can see the old puddle, and now it's distended. Mm. And whatever the bog, there's actually a whole floristic, there was, there was a great floristic inventory right before that. Um, there's a bunch of things that grew in the bog mat, just like it was Holly Bog or one of these other places that are gone. We don't have the flora at Mount Topia anymore. Uh, one of the sundews, uh, cotton grass, some of these characteristic bog mat plants that have been underwater for almost 100 years now. But great question. Yeah. Oh. Gigi had her hand up. So, would you ever lead a walking hike? Oh, boy. <laughs> I, I, ha I, I have okay. for, yeah. Yeah, I've done walks for the UMass Club and New England Botanical Society. That's, I, I'll plug for the New England Botanical Society does botanical walks oh, statewide like every year. And they've got, Karen has done them at Mount Toby. I've led one at, have I? I've fled them locally. Maybe one I haven't done one at Toby. Um, you ever decide to do one on Mount? <laughs> we could publicize it. That's, that's good to keep in mind. Yeah. <laughs> natural history. Mm -hmm. and, um, at the summit, um, maybe 10 years ago, there, there were a bunch of hard ones that died on. What, what were they and what killed them? So I saw that myself, and they were red oak, and I, was, I put this question to the state. Forest Health Director, and he told me it was uh, anthracnose, which is a fungus. So anthracnose is a general term for fungus that infects tree limbs and leaves. And it has something to do with the fog in the valley, oh. exacerbating the anthracnose to the point where the trees on the summit, there's you know, one more stressor from whatever else they were dealing with. That's what I was told. What did, why did the trees choose that the location? <laughs> there must have been something there that they, I mean. That's where the blue jays planted it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I've heard there used so, to be pitch pine at the side in the 19th uh, century. Yeah. It was all cut over or burned down or whatever. But, um, so it's, I don't know what, whether, the, whether the community at the summit is representative of what it used to be. All right, we've gone amply over, but I appreciate your time.